Good afternoon. Welcome to Medical Grand Round. I'm Bob Wachter, Chair of the Department of Medicine. Uh, before I announce today's speaker, a little bit of a programming note for the next couple of weeks. I know a fair number of people follow uh, us for the COVID topics, and we, the next two weeks, we'll be doing uh, uh, both COVID topics. Next week uh, will be a combo. It will be Paul Turner of Yale, who's one of the nation's top evolutionary biologists, and he's going to discuss variants and uh, why they happen and uh, how Delta happened and whether that we may have more in our future. I'm hoping not. Along with Paul will be Michael Mina of Harvard. We'll come back uh, for a return visit. Um, Michael, you've probably seen uh, all of the media. He's really been the nation's foremost advocate for testing, particularly rapid testing, and he will discuss uh, where we stand with testing. Uh, the following week, I will have a conversation with our old friend and UCSF residency graduate, Ashish Jha, uh, Dean of the Brown School of Public Health, and then we will go back to non-COVID topics uh, the week after that. Uh, the ground rules are up here, uh, and you see uh, you see them. I'll put the Zoom window in full screen mode. If you have questions, type them in the Q and A box. We'll get to as many as we can. My colleague uh, Lex, Lexmi uh, Santosh, who is becoming has become the director of our grand rounds, uh, will be mining them. Uh, the session will be recorded, and we will post it on YouTube in a couple of days. Closed captioning is available. And if you're interested in CME credits, please stay on at the end. A QR code will pop up on the screen. And if you take a picture of that, it will take you to the website for you to get CME credit. Uh, let's get to uh, today's topic and speaker. Uh, we turn to what I think is one of the most exciting scientific advances in all of medicine, and particularly in the field of brain, scientists, uh, brain science, and <clears throat> the a physician scientist between, uh, behind most of these discoveries is a colleague here at UCSF, Eddie Chang. Eddie uh, practices clinically, seeing patients with epilepsy and brain tumors, uh, and he has also pioneered methods of brain mapping to understand how the brain uh, does the magic it does when it comes to speech, movement, and emotion. Uh, Eddie co-directs the Center for Neural Engineering and Prostheses, which is a joint center between UCSF and UC Berkeley, and which brings together experts in neurology, neurosurgery, and engineering to develop and test new approaches for various neurological uh, disabilities. <clears throat> and you have probably seen him and his work profiled in the New York Times, NPR, and assorted other uh, places. Eddie attended Amherst, uh, came to UCSF for medical school and residency, and has stayed Ever since, he's won uh, numerous awards, including the Blavatnik National Laureate Award in 2015. And last year, uh, he was inducted into the National Academy of Medicine. So uh, thrilled that Eddie is a colleague at UCSF. Uh, last year, he became the chair of the Department of Neurosurgery. So we work very closely with his spectacular uh, department, which was ranked the best in the country by US News uh, last year. And uh, he's really a, 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 a amazing uh, uh, faculty member and contributor to uh, all things at UCSF. I uh, really look forward to hearing his talk today, which is called Restoring Words Towards a Speech Neuroprosthesis. So, Eddie, the forum is yours. Thanks, Bob. I'm just trying to get the video started here, and uh, I'm going to share my slides. There you are. We see you. Great. Okay. Yep, we're good. All right, here we go. Uh, Bob, thanks. Um, it's really great to be with all of you today. Uh, many of you are friends, longtime friends from medical school and residency and beyond. And um, for me, it's a, it's a true honor to be able to share this next hour with you about a passion of mine for the last decade, uh, which has been uh, a two-part story. The first part is years-long quest to understand how the brain processes language and what goes awry when people have injuries to part of the brain, part of the brain that, that is responsible for language processing. And then a parallel translational effort to use that knowledge to create what we call a speech neuroprosthesis. It's a device that records brain activity and is designed to translate that brain activity into words and sentences. And so um, in this next hour, I just wanted to share some of the highlights from this um, incredible journey that I've been really fortunate to lead with um, the collaborators in my group. 
here are my disclosures. Our funding is primarily from the NIH, the Howard Hughes and Simons Foundation. We have some IP related to speech decoding algorithms that you'll hear about. So um, probably the best place for me to start is, is just to explain why I got into this field. And uh, the first time I saw an awake brain surgery here at UCSF with our former chairman, Dr. Berger, who was my mentor as a medical student and resident, um, really opened my eyes uh, to this fascinating question of how the substrate of the brain, uh, the physical structure or structure of the organ, the brain, can give rise to something as complex as our thoughts, emotions, and, and language. And I became very interested in speech. Um, speech is the form that most of us use to communicate and is known as a unique and defining property of, of our species. Um, the way that it works is that we use our lungs to create uh, the breath and that comes up through the laryngeal folds and the vibrations in the larynx give rise to the voice signal. It's the noise that's generated from the vibrations of the larynx that are then filtered by the upper parts of the vocal tract, the tongue, the jaw, the lips. And um, it's after that filtering that we get basically things like consonants and vowels. And it's a very re remarkable process. Um, some people regard it as the most complex motor skill that we do, despite the fact that most of us do it effortlessly. And part of the reasons why people consider it so complex is because the coordination requires, um, you know, uh, coordination across hundreds of muscles that are within the vocal tract. And then that it's very fast on the order of 120 to 200 words per minute when we speak. It's the fastest way that we communicate information. Um, and, turns out we don't really know actually that much about how the brain processes speech, controls the vocal tract. And my lab studies both the part of the brain that processes what you hear and translates sound into words, but also the inverse process, the motor control by which the brain controls the vocal tracts to give rise to words. And I'm going to focus on just that part of our work uh, for this talk is just focus on the part that controls the muscles, in fact, uh, of the vocal tract. And I really like this illustration from Harvey Cushing. He's um, recognized as really the, the father of modern neurosurgery. One thing that was really incredible about Harvey Cushing was that on top of inventing many of the modern, you know, the techniques of modern neurosurgery, he was also an amazing illustrator and hand drew a lot of the cases that he saw. And in this particular case, um, he was describing essentially a patient that he had seen that had a bullet that came in through the top of the calvarium and exited in the temporal lobe here. But the reason why I'm actually showing you this picture was because in 1906, he was describing the knowledge that they had back then about the organization of the part of the motor, the motor cortex, which is lateral um, uh, part of the, uh, the cerebrum. And the part that's exposed here is actually the part that corresponds to the face, the lips, the jaw, the tongue, and the vocal folds. You can see down here, they're calling vocal cords, um, a laryngeal representation. And this makes sense because it was sort of like this orderly topographic map this uh, representation of all the different parts of our body. In fact, the hand area is right up here. And so if you go back and think about, you know, what you learned in medical school and, and neurobiology, um, this is what we thought were really how things were organized in this part of the brain. And uh, this is just a blow, a blow up of and zoom in of that anatomy. It turns out this was actually a precursor to Wilder Penfield's much more famous homunculus. Homunculus means little man. And the idea here basically was that there is this map of the different parts of your body um, that are mapped out in the motor cortex and they correspond to different things. And how this map translates into things that are as dynamic as speech is what we've been really focused on. And so the approach that we've had to this um, has been to use the setting of brain surgery and patients that have had to undergo brain surgery primarily for the localization of seizures. And at UCSF, um, we're a tertiary quaternary epilepsy center and we see a lot of cases here where uh, the source of the seizures are not obvious from the MRI. In fact, the MRI can look completely normal 
uh, but there is a functional disturbance within the brain. And in many of these cases, we implant uh, electrodes subdurally directly on the surface of the brain, oftentimes for seven to 10 days uh, during a surgery. Um, to implant the surgery, patients are um, uh, have the wires that are tunneled out and everything is closed, but we have them monitored in the hospital for seven to 10 days. And we use this information to help localize where the seizures are. Uh, on the left, you can basically see what I see in the operating room, which is absolutely exquisite, the surface of the human brain, the substrate of our, our mind and cognition. And then on the right is a 3D model of a patient's brain with some of the electrodes that are placed there to help map out where the seizures are coming from. And um, the setting in which we do this is in um, one of our hospital rooms. So um, one of the reasons I'm bringing this up is just the, you know, the one of the deepest lessons I've learned is really about the opportunities for learning uh, with our patients and from them. So I wanted to describe a little bit about how we do this work. And these are two of our former graduate students, David Conan and Leah Muller, uh, working with one of our patients who was seen in the hospital and has um, um, is undergoing some testing, one of our postdoctoral fellows and patient's mom watching on as we do some experiments. And in this particular experiment, she's reading uh, words on a screen and talking into a microphone while our camera and microphone are, are monitoring her speech uh, activity. And some of you might be wondering why, why are we doing it like this? You know, there's a lot of tools that we have like EEG, MEG, uh, fMRI, a lot of acronyms for different ways to image the human brain. It turns out in reality, um, we don't have a tool right now actually that allows us to measure brain activity with very high spatial and temporal resolution. We have some tools that are good at one or the other, but not both. And it turns out that the recordings that we can get from these electrodes directly on the brain are the highest resolution that we actually have. Um, to monitor brain activity. It turns out this is very important for trying to understand speech because it happens so quickly. In this video that I'm gonna show you, you're gonna see the brain activity that occurs in this motor cortex when someone is speaking. And you'll see that it's not just a blur of activity, but in fact, a very precise uh, spatial temporal pattern of activity. It's in fact, a pattern of neural activity that occurs when we speak. Ship building is a most fascinating process. So what you just saw there was the electrical readout from electrodes at each one of these positions. And with this technique, we have the resolution of millimeters and milliseconds. Uh, the code that is uh, being played out here is what we refer to as the neural code. And it's this code that gives rise to all of the control of the vocal tract. If you have an injury in this part of the brain, you will have a condition called dysarthria or anarthria uh, with paralysis with parts of the face and, and vocal tract that give rise to speech. And so we know this part is very important. And what we've been doing for the last 10 years is to uh, essentially decipher how that code works to give rise to, to words. Um, I'll share with you just one or two of the projects that we've been working on. Um, this one was particularly uh, of interest to me, which was uh, understanding uh, the representation of the larynx, um, the, vo the voice box in the brain. And the voice box um, or the larynx is important for two things. One is creating the voice signal that gives rise to speech, um, the vibrations and the vocal folds, and that occurs with uh, abduction of the vocal folds. And then the second signal, and the one that I'll be talking about is uh, the pitch, the intonation of the voice that allows us to stress certain words to change the meaning. One of our graduate students, Ben Dichter, um, who graduated about four or five years ago now, created this task um, that he, he got from Reddit. And what he was trying to do was to understand uh, a linguistic speech related tasks where he could study essentially how uh, intonational pitch is processed when we uh, speak uh, words and sentences. And he found this on Reddit. And the idea here is if I say something like this, I never said she stole my money. It's very different than if I said, I never said she stole my money. Okay, so the intonation and the pitch of my voice actually changes the meaning. In this last one, for example, it changed um, the statement to a question. So we use intonation all the time. And what Ben discovered, in fact, was that there is a part of 
the brain on both the left and right hemisphere that is actually directly underneath the hand area that corresponds to uh, movements within uh, the larynx. And we call it a dorsal larynx cortex because again, about a hundred years ago, even Penfield and Cushing knew that there was a, a ventral larynx cortex because that's what made sense with the somatotopic organization of the motor cortex. But this was a new discovery, which was that there are in fact a separate laryngeal representation that is directly under the hand knob. And to our knowledge, this is something that is not observed in non-human primates like uh, monkeys. Ben did some control experiments and found that activity in this particular part of the brain, which is about three centimeters from the top of your ear, um, is also activated when you sing melodies. So those pitches in you know, a do, re, mi um, are activated here. And it's not the specific vowels and consonants, but the pitch of the voice that is encoded by activity. And then also Ben showed that when you play back speech to the subjects that, you know, that recorded these sentences, you can actually see that they have auditory responses too. And that was a fascinating thing that we have auditory sensory responses in parts of the motor cortex and they are tuned to pitch as well. So this area is complex. It's not just the motor control. Uh, because we were um, seeing these sensory responses, we wanted to do some control experiments to prove that in fact, this was in the muscular control of the vocal tract. And we actually did some experiments and uh, studies in patients who volunteered as part of their brain mapping to um, understand if we could stimulate those muscles directly as recorded with EMG. And this was done with wires that were placed on the endotracheal tube during uh, anesthetic uh, general anesthesia, brain surgery. And we actually stimulated these areas up here and could evoke movements. Um, and in fact, as you increase the current on the stimulator in this particular uh, part of the brain, you can in fact evoke larger laryngeal movements. And uh, this was a causal proof that this part of the brain, which we really only discovered in the last decade, um, is involved with the control of the larynx and speech. And um, it was assumption that all of this was fixed from over a hundred years ago, but in fact, um, our knowledge is, is changing um, uh, as recently as the last decade. And so um, with this, I wanted to share with you um, uh, a video of what actually happens when you stimulate parts of these areas when someone is awake. And another part of what I love to do in our practice is take care of patients who um, have uh, epilepsy or tumors in a part of the brain that is uh, close to areas that are important for language. Um, and many of you know that we specialize in awake brain mapping surgeries here at UCSF. There's a very long tradition and uh, apprenticeship and, and um, training that we go with, uh, that we've had here. And I was very fortunate to be part of that tradition here. But um, this is a picture of the operating room. This was uh, a surgery that I did early on in my career. And you can see that I'm on one side of the uh, surgical field and our, uh, our nursing team, our neuropsychologists and technicians are on the other side, uh, taking care of a patient who is uh, fully awake. And uh, we can do this by using local anesthetics uh, uh, that numb the scalp. And that allows us to get to the cerebrum with just uh, what we call regional block of um, the scalp. And so this is the surgical field. I'm looking at the brain surface there. Uh, with the surgical nurses. And then on the other side of the field are our uh, nurses that uh, care of the anesthesia and do some of the testing. So this is in particular uh, a picture naming task where people are looking at a screen and um, naming the object. And um, this is a very special um, kind of experience um, that takes a really coordinated team approach to do well. So uh, back to some of the physiology, you know, some of the other things that we've looked at is not just the larynx, but the control of the lips, jaw, and tongue. And this is really an understudied area of neuroscience because the movements of the face and the vocal tract are very complex. They're very different than the skeletal muscles that we have in our limbs, for example, which are joint-based. Uh, the lips are um, a sphincter kind of muscle. Uh, the tongue has the dynamics of a hydrostat, kind of like a waterbed where you press down on one side and the other side goes up. Um, these are very, very complex kinds of biodynamics. 
And for that reason, it, you know, it just hasn't been as well studied on top of the fact that it's not easy to study um, because they're not easily visible. So we developed methods to um, do this non-invasively, um, patients who have had implanted electrodes, um, instead of just trying to understand what part of the, the vocal tract is involved, we actually want to understand the next level of question, which is the kinematic properties, the position, the velocity, acceleration of muscles, and tracking them in real time is the only way to do that and correlating that with the brain activity. And um, by being able to do that, um, we, to, about three years ago, were able to really come up with the first complete dictionary or uh, inventory of the neural code for every consonant and vowel in the English language. And I'll, I'll give you an example of what that looks like. If you look at this yellow dot in the upper left, that corresponds to the location of one given electrode in that part of the motor cortex. And what we discovered was that that one particular spot in your brain is important for articulating the p sound, for example, in proof. And um, we use these digital simulated videos to show you essentially what is the movement that is being encoded by that one part of the brain. You can see the lips come together and apart, and that's the critical movement when you say a p sound. There's no other way to say p beyond the release of the lips uh, in, in that's being shown here. And I want to contrast that to another electrode, again, which is only two or three millimeters away that has a different kind of encoded movement, the th sound in that. If you try that, you will feel your tongue move forward to the front of the mouth. And that movement is what allows you to make that th sound. So just um, a site nearby that has a completely different movement gives rise to a different kind of speech sound. And as I alluded to just a second ago, um, over the years, we've been able to look at dozens of electrodes, well, dozens of uh, hundreds of electrodes across dozens of patients. And uh, each column here corresponds to a given electrode that we've recorded to in different parts of the vocal tract. And below that are all the different phonemes. There are about 40 phonemes, which are speech sounds in the English language. The point of this is to show that we now can account for every consonant and vowel in the English language in terms of the electrical code um, in, in this part of the brain, the motor cortex for the vocal tract. And um, it was very exciting to see this. It got us thinking about a different challenge, which was if we now know the code for every consonant and vowel in the English language, could we use that knowledge to translate information in that electro code to help people who are paralyzed and have had um, essentially a disconnection of the cerebrum to uh, the vocal tract or the limbs, et cetera, for uh, restoration of movement. And in this particular case in our lab, um, a speech neuroprosthetic. And so on the left is essentially a virtual uh, vocal tract that we're trying to build that would be controlled by brain activity. And um, that's a project that's underway. And the reason we're doing this is because there's this huge unmet need for people who suffer paralysis as it relates to communication. Many of you have seen patients with brainstem stroke, ALS, cerebral palsy. Um, what's unique about some patients with these conditions is that um, many cases, it's the, the cognition is fully intact. And uh, the most extreme case is what we call locked-in syndrome. Uh, where you have intact cognition awareness, but paralysis of nearly all voluntary movement. And probably the most famous person in the world who ever had that um, was Stephen Hawking. And this particular quote uh, is one that I really appreciate. He writes, although I cannot move and I have to speak through a computer, in my mind, I am free. And I think his case was a very powerful example of the disconnect between uh, his brilliant genius mind um, and the limitations that he had with his body in, in terms of communicating um, his, his thoughts and ideas. So why are we focusing on speech? We actually uh, did a comparison across a lot of different communication rates that are available uh, for people who can communicate normally, for example, handwriting. 
on the order of 10 to 20 words per minute texting uh, with predictive uh, uh, coding can get you up to about 40 words per minute typing about 50 uh, professional typewriter is about 70 and why speech is special is because it's like an order of magnitude uh, faster information rate than really any other ways of communicating. It's a very special domain, and that's what makes it so special as a human ability. And um, this is where we're going to. We're definitely far from that, but um, um, we're trying to restore speech at that, uh, at, at that rate eventually. There's two approaches that we've tried. There's many different things that you could try. We're trying to decode brain activity to, um, to restore speech. Uh, one is trying to restore um, and, and decode movements, the intended articulatory movements of the vocal tract and using those decoded movements to create um, sounds using a speech synthesizer. And another approach is to actually decode phonemes and infer what individual speech sounds like the ba, pa, da sounds in, in words and then integrate that what's known as a language model um, which is a statistical model of language uh, to create text. So one is a speech output, which is sound, another, which is text. And um, I'll first describe one proof of principle study that we did in epilepsy patients where they were speaking sentences. And we just wanted to see if we could translate the brain activity into full sentences. Uh, in terms of audio. And the way that we did this was to use uh, a kind of artificial intelligence called recurrent neural network. Um, the first part of this approach and this algorithm was to take the brain activity and to decode the intended, um, or, or in this case, the actual movements of the vocal tract, and then to take a different model, a different neural network model and to take those decoded movements and translate them into audible synthetic speech. So it was a two part decoder. One part was decoding brain activity into uh, inferred kinematic movements of the vocal tract. And the second thing was to move and decode those movements into audible speech sounds. And um, this is what we saw qualitatively. Um, this, the upper spectrogram, spectrogram is a frequency as a function of time plot of the audio that was recorded in the microphone in the room. And this is an example of two sentences that were spoken by uh, our epilepsy patients that participate in this study. And below is the spectrogram from what we could decode just from the brain activity alone. So you can see that um, a lot of the energy contours in terms of the spectrum, the high frequency and the low, is very much preserved from the computer decoding, but a lot of the fine information and the fine structure uh, of that is lost. And so we're working on making this better, but what was exciting to us and other people in our field was that this was one of the first demonstrations that um, the speech was just starting to be intelligible. And that's where we were when we did this, which was you know, one of the first demonstrations that we were in the ballpark of just starting to be intelligible. And um, there's a lot of work to get that better. This video that you're gonna see is essentially that neural code. When someone speaks a given sentence, you're gonna see the decoded movements of the vocal tract from that brain activity. And then the last thing that you're gonna hear is the decoded synthesized speech from the computer. And just so that you had a comparison, we also played the original spoken sentences from the person who participated in the study. So you can compare yourself. You're first gonna hear what's decoded by the computer from brain activity alone. And then you'll hear what the person actually said. The proof that you are seeking is sign law of only rules. The proof that you are seeking is not available in books. The proof that you are seeking is sign law of only rules. Shoot building within my smash city process. Shoot building is a most fascinating process. 
she filled it with the masmasinic process. So these are just some examples, proof of principle in people who are normally speaking up here in eighth floor of lung hospital had implanted electrodes, normally speaking. And again, we just wanted to see if you could translate brain activity into synthesized speech. And about two and a half years ago, we showed that it is possible to do that. And uh, there's a lot of work to get that more accurate and more um, precise, but again, starting to become intelligible. Um, on the heels of that demonstration, we started thinking seriously about translating this knowledge, this infrastructure that we had for machine learning and, and AI on brain activity and speech knowledge towards a clinical trial and someone who was actually paralyzed. And this was a huge big step for us as a group. Um, a lot of what we were doing was proof of principle, basic science uh, demonstrations, but none of it had been done in someone who was actually paralyzed. And at that time we felt, okay, let's give it a try. We think that we understand about how this works. There's still some major challenges, but let's start a clinical trial. And I teamed up with one of my colleagues, Karnesh Ganguly in the Department of Neurology, who's a rehab neurologist. Um, and we created something called the BRAVO trial. Um, the BRAVO trial is a small um, uh, proof of concept uh, pilot clinical trial to see if we could use this technology to restore function for people who are paralyzed. And the part of the study that I worked on is the part that has to do with restoring communication for speech. Um, the first person who participated in the study was implanted about two years ago. And the results from that first in human study were recently published in the New England Journal uh, earlier this summer. The title of the article is Neuroprosthesis for Decoding Speech in a Paralyzed Person with Anarthria. Anarthria is a severe form of dysarthria. Um, basically means that person can still have vocalizations. Uh, they're not mute. Mutism is something different. Uh, but our, and our three refers to the inability to create intelligible speech and uh, this particular individual um, had a stroke 15 years ago when he was about 20 years old uh, as a result of a brain a brainstem stroke um, uh, as a result of a car accident that had a complication that led to a brainstem stroke. So here's some examples of his vocalizations. He primarily creates groans and moans, uh, but not intelligible speech. So instead, he actually communicates with some of the residual movements that he has in his neck and head. And he has a, um, a pointer, a stick basically, that's attached to his baseball cap. And he uses this to type out on a communication device. And it's a very painstaking process. Uh, he in fact is very eloquent, and, uh, but it takes him about um, one minute to produce about five words, which is very inefficient and, and very laborious. This is the sagittal MRI that shows the encephalomalacia, the atrophy in the part of the pons in the brainstem um, after he had that brainstem stroke. And so as many of you recall, the brainstem is the conduit in the connection between the cerebrum, which in his case is completely intact and the spinal cord and the cranial nerves that come out to control the vocal tract. So this was a devastating injury that he woke up with, uh, with the loss of ability to speak. So this is just a schematic of what um, we did in this particular trial. He was implanted with a 128 electrode array over the speech motor cortex, and this was connected to a digital head stage uh, and port, yet a port that was a uh, percutaneous port, and to that port, we connected a, uh, a connector that amplified and trans transformed the analog signals from his brain into digital ones that could be amplified. And we analyzed those signals, again, using forms of machine learning to translate those brain activities into words. And the algorithm translates them and classifies the words. We first started with 
50 word vocabulary. And it gives us a ranking of the probability of all 50 words. The most likely is the one that's shown on top, but keeps track of all the other probability of all the other words. And then that uh, information is integrated with a language model. A language model is a statistical model of the, um, the sequence of letters and, and words in English. And all of you have experience with this because you use texting and um, word processors that can um, correct uh, spelling and whatnot because of this statistical model that we call language model. So the output of that is displayed out on a screen. So he sees the prompt, the data is recorded, analyzed in real time, and then the, the decoded responses from his brain activity are displayed back on a screen. Uh, this is just a clo close up photo. So this is a port that he's lived with for the last two years, percutaneous, and, um, and he's done very well and has been very healthy with this. Um, this is just a, a picture of me connecting this digital head stage to it in all the 128 channels. In the future, of course, this will be wireless. Uh, but for this first uh, pilot study, um, we decided to do it percutaneously because the device to do this currently doesn't exist. Uh, that would be fully uh, wireless. And here is some of the results, the first 50 words, uh, the accuracy. Uh, these were the actual words that we asked him to say and then um, what was actually decoded from the machine learning algorithms after some training period. And uh, on average, I would say it was about 50% correct for a given word. Um, on a given trial, we were up to 70 to 80% accurate for given words. And then in combination with a language model, on average, it was about 75% accurate. And then on some trials, as high as 93% accurate. Um, so we saw a huge range and we're looking into why some days the decoding is better than others. Um, some of it actually has to do with the similarity of some of the words, whether they're short or long, or if they have the same phonetic content, they become more confusable. Uh, but here's a video demonstration of what this looks like in, in real time. Um, we work with this participant um, who goes by the nickname Pancho. He lives up uh, in a facility up in Sonoma and our research team goes up there to work with him basically every day. This is a, a a picture of the digital head stage that is connected there and um, during the during the experiments and the sessions you'll see a conversational prompt this is someone from the research team writing to him a question and then below you will see essentially what is decoded from his brain activity the blinking dots correspond to the first step of their algorithm which detects when he is trying to speak and you'll see the blinking dots occur when that happens and then um, the next step is decoding the actual words This next example that you're gonna see, we intentionally included because you'll see that um, the individual word decoding uh, initially looks wrong, but because the model is keeping track of all the ranked probabilities of all the words, i.e. the second, third, fourth, fifth word, not just the top one, and then uses the sequence context, we can use that language model to correct it uh, because it keeps track of all of those probabilities. And so, what initially looks incorrect actually can get revised on the fly. And uh, it's just an example of autocorrect in, in real time. So um, these are just some examples and it's far from where we wanna get up to, you know, which is 100 to, to 150 words per minute. Uh, currently it's about uh, 20 uh, words per minute, but um, definitely an improvement of from where he was before. And um, there's a lot of effort right now to to make this uh, possible with a much larger vocabulary. 50 words is where we just started. Um, as Bob alluded to, this, this 
this paper and this story was actually covered in the New York Times and some of you may have seen this. Um, one of the reasons why I'm including it here is because I really give credit to the, to the writer, uh, Pam Bellick, who, who wrote this story because um, even though I think it's really interesting what we did with the science and the engineering to make this happen, um, there was a whole nother side which we rarely get to talk about, which is the human side of, of what happens for people um, and suffer from this kind of paralysis. And um, I, I really think that um, it, it describes the, the bravery and, um, and a lot of the other aspects that, you know, that made him a pioneer, really the first person in the world to have his uh, brain activity and thoughts decoded into words in real time. Um, the other people I want to also acknowledge uh, is a huge team, but in particular, three of um, our students and fellows, uh, Jesse Leo, David Moses, who's now a postdoctoral fellow, and, and Sean Metzger. They were, they were uh, three of the most critical people uh, of this big team uh, who worked on this and really put uh, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into making this project happen. Um, and it, it requires a lot of collaboration with engineering, linguistics, medicine, and more, as you can imagine. So I just want to summarize that it's been an extraordinary last 10 years working on the scientific elements of just trying to update our understanding of how the brain gives rise to speech and language. And I've showed you how um, even now we're discovering new things about how the homunculus, the little man uh, part of the motor cortex that, that controls our movements is organized. Um, a lot of the things that we saw, for example, in additional laryngeal cortex were things that I didn't believe, frankly, when we first saw our preliminary results because they just hadn't been described, but is, is just a constant reminder of me, uh, to me and our team of how much there is to still discover about uh, how the brain works. Um, I've also described about how our knowledge has moved to um, not just like what part of the brain, but actually kinematic properties and the articulatory trajectories, the position velocity elements of kinematics that give rise to speech. And we think of these things as speech primitives. Um, these movements, the, the lip closure, the tongue tip movement to the front of the uh, mouth, these are what we call uh, speech primitives. And by themselves, they have no meaning. But um, when they're coordinated as an orchestra, as a symphony, when we speak, they give rise to every consonant and vowel. And from that, every syllable, every word, and uh, from there, every possible meaning. It's, it's an incredible generative system that gives rise to um, uh, our ability to convey so much. And then the last part was about how we use the population activity, not just the single electrodes, but the entire population, how we've translated that knowledge to uh, building a brain computer interface, a neuroprosthetic to help restore uh, communication for people who are paralyzed. And so, um, I wanted to conclude there and thank all of you for being amazing colleagues um, and um, really look forward to conversation and um, the future work in this area. Thank you very much. Fabulous, Eddie. That's uh, boy, <laughs> I was about to say mind blowing is obviously the wrong word, but uh, really, really interesting. And, and uh, congratulations to you and your team for all of this extraordinary work. Uh, let me start out with a couple of questions and uh, Lakshmi is minding the Q&A. So if others come in, we will get to them. What does uh, what you've learned about the connection between I'm thinking something and I'm speaking uh, teach you about I'm thinking something and I'm moving? Or so, you know, I've decided I wanna lift my left hand now. Is there, are these very different kinds of functions or your understanding of the generation of this movement in my mouth teaches us something that may help us with other kinds of paralysis? Yeah, great question. Um, it turns out that the distinction between just thinking about something versus actually doing it turns out to be an absolutely critical one. And we don't actually have that much information uh, about the neural coding for just thinking about moving the left arm. Um, in all of the experiments that we've done, for example, if you ask subjects to just imagine, for example, speaking, it just doesn't work very well. The mm -hmm. code is, is much less robust. And there's something about the volitional intent to move that is very important uh, for everything that we've seen so far. And, um, 
And we've never really wanted to get in the realm of decoding what people were thinking uh, because although there could be practical medical benefits from that, um, really this was just about trying to restore what people actually want to say. Right. And so um, as of yet, we don't necessarily have a way to uh, read people's thoughts or, or minds in that kind of way. Um, um, and certainly not what someone doesn't want to say, but it's a natural question that comes up when people may see this. Yeah, one of the, uh, actually, it did come in as a question for, given the success with, with speech, what do you see as the upper limits? For example, will decoding visual representations ultimately be possible? Dreams and to what resolution? It sounds like there are both practical barriers, but you, you basically think ethical barriers as well that may prevent you from going in that direction. Absolutely. I mean, I, I'm just basically saying that, you know, we can't do it right now. Um, people have demonstrated things in, in and animal models like rodents and monkeys that suggest that such things like that are possible. Um, and I actually do think that that is gonna be possible with the right technology. And um, I don't see why not, frankly, right now. Um, and that's coming. So I, I do think it's worth actually starting those discussions actually about what the implications are ethically for where do you draw the line and- Yeah, yeah. Um, those it seems like a, one of the big technological leaps will be the the, the necessity or non necessity of taking off the skull. Uh, so how far away from? I mean, you do a lot of work, and the rollers do a ton of work with electrodes placed on the outside. How far away f are we from the kind of resolution that you need uh, without having to go inside? Yeah, great question. So um, obviously, everything I've described is very invasive, requires brain surgery. Um, Fortunately, this is not in the brain. That's a different level of risk. This is stuff that's placed on the brain surface. And actually, safety profile is, is, is very good. You know, uh, for, for these type of procedures that we do for epilepsy, you know, the complication rate is, is, is relatively low on the order of like 2 to 3%. Um, but the reality is, is we still don't have that, that tool that we need uh, for imaging the brain in high spatial and temporal resolution. In fact, that's why we do these surgeries to implant these electrodes, because given everything we have right now, sometimes and oftentimes we can't figure out where these seizures are coming from because we just don't have that combined spatial and temporal resolution. And so um, I know a lot of people are working on it. It may even require new forms of physics to figure out how to do this. I'm hopeful that it's possible, but for now, um, it looks like you know it's going to require some degree of surgery to figure this out. Yeah. Uh, one of our viewers asked, these trials focused on people that have lost their ability to speak. Do you think this would translate well to people that have always been nonverbal? I, as I, I had the same thought thinking about autistic kids, for example, and actually I have no idea in autism whether they are producing speech thoughts and it's not getting to the right place or they're not producing them in, in, the, in the usual way uh, in the first place? Yeah, um, well, we don't know yet. Um, clearly, everything that we've done is involved people who have something to say and wanna say it. Um, so the number one requirement is the cognition and the language faculty. Uh, but one of the things that we're wondering about and something that we're hopefully going to start looking at in the next couple of years is, and especially once we can get this form factor into a fully implantable device, is to thinking about children, for example, with certain forms of cerebral palsy who, um, who can't speak because they have this, you know, they have extreme limitations in muscular control. And why we're particularly interested in that is that we now know that having exposure to language and being able to have language early in life is really important for the development of cognition. We know that from the cochlear implant. You know, if you restore a child's hearing, they can actually develop normal language. But if you don't, and you don't give them alternative system like sign language, um, there will be huge cognitive consequences in, in language development. And so, um, we're exploring whether there is same potential for children who um, have never had the ability to speak. Yeah. Um, you talked about the 
well, one question, it, interesting, the model sort of ends up in synthesized speech, which I assume is so good that, 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 uh, that going through the trouble of trying to stimulate your vocal cords in the right way, I don't know if it's even worth the trouble, but talk about the, the difference between your output being synthesized versus in a world where you figured this out, you connect electrodes to the right places on people's larynx and they're speaking normally through their mouth. Yeah, Bob, I mean, you're, you're, steps, you're steps way ahead of us. Um, you know, it's just, that's where ideally this could all go, which is not just the brain recording, but actually implanted stimulating electrodes in the different parts of the vocal tract that can cause the specific kind of contractions that can uh, give rise to speech. And people have shown proofs of principle of this with um, neuroprosthetics for limb movement. So for example, you can have brain activity, essentially control stimulators that stimulate muscles in the arm to create a grasp, for example, or elevate the arm. And I think in the future, we should be thinking about how to activate muscles in the vocal tract as well. But as you reviewed the the ballet of making a sound, it seems like, and I know nothing about this, it seems like that is so much more challenging and elegant to produce the right set of phonations as opposed to lifting my lifting my arm. Is that is that right? Or is am I un underestimating how hard it is to do regular motor movement as well? Well, um, it is far more complicated, as I alluded to in the very beginning, that um, if you're off by a little bit, it just doesn't work at all and becomes unintelligible. Mm -hmm. And so um, while I, I think that this would be an amazing long-term goal, the reality is if we can just restore communication rates, you know, that are faster, I, I think that it will help a lot of people with the suffering. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I understand this question. Let me read it to you and you will probably understand it. This is a long shot, but uh, would you uh, talk about someone just won the Lasker Prize about flashes of light that would help turn on and off the areas that probe targets. Does that sound familiar to you? And I think they even put in a uh, reference to uh, uh, to that. Does that? It sounds like stimulation being through through light rather than uh, the, than the probes. Oh yeah. Um, again, we didn't really do any stimulation with this. Um, this was well. I did show you a video of how we do the brain mapping with stimulation, but mm -hmm. everything else that I showed was really about recording the electrical potentials from the brain and not really stimulating, but there is incredible work um, that is going on using a technique called optogenetics, basically using light. And uh, you can actually use a form of gene therapy to make neurons sensitive to light and, and, and activate neuronal action potentials just by shining light on, on them. And that will be a form of neural interface in the future. So it won't just be confined to electrical stimulation. I was impressed in one of the videos where you tried to uh, synthesize the speech and the speech wasn't as clear as it could have been. And I could imagine that the model, the, 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 uh, the machine learning model, would have known that this sounds like this word and come out more intelligible than what it seemed like it was doing, which was putting together a set of some different phonations or different phrases. So what, what are the pluses and minuses of... Yeah. of sort of the gestalt of what you're overall trying to say, and then the machine kind of figures that out and says it in a more intelligible way, as opposed to going phrase by phrase? Yeah, really good question. Um, okay, so um, an alternative approach we could have took, for example, is to just try to decode those words and sentences and just have something like Siri or whatever, read it out so it's right. super clear and intelligible. The problem with it is that the error rate can be relatively high, meaning that if you get the wrong word and it senses the wrong word, it will be completely off. Mm -hmm. We actually tried that. And um, even though it may be intelligible, it may actually be wrong. Got it. And so what people don't fully appreciate with that demonstration that I showed, which is part of it is actually what's being generated by the computer in terms of those synthesized sounds. But the other, I would say equally important part is our perceptual system that allows us to hear that noisy sound and to translate that into words. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty remarkable actually that you could actually, you know, hear words in, in that godly book, you know, that we decoded. And um, so there's a trade-off, you know, between accuracy and intelligibility. And um, in that particular case, we were favoring 
um, the accuracy in terms of the readout. And part of it relies on the listener's ability to robustly interpret what they're hearing. And when, when you had that kind of autocorrect in the video at the end, was it because the algorithm said this doesn't seem right? Or was it because the guy was thinking, I see a word on the screen and that's not actually what I meant? No, it was, it was, it was actually the former. So it was complete the algorithm that says that this word followed this word doesn't make sense. This is not something that would jive in English. And so it's looking over all of the possible sentences that are constructed with those words and the probability of what was decoded, the second, third, and fourth ranked words and reordering them in a way that um, would make something sensical. And that's what happens with the autocorrect on our, our cell phones and word yep. processors. All right, well, last question. I'm gonna go to France in 15 years. Can I potentially put on the cap that I think the sentence in English and it goes and gets uh, translates that into French and I just speak that way by thinking and, 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 and we, uh, we come up with a different language that way? Um, I'm not sure about the just thinking part, but um, I do think it's gonna be possible to add translation on the back end of these things. In fact, I know it's possible. And um, we're looking at things like that. In fact, the participant in our, in our trial is bilingual, Spanish, English. And so um, there's a lot of fascinating work to be done about multilinguistic representations and how to think about how to restore not just one language, but two languages and essentially modules that you would turn on and off with a decoder, uh, given your context. It's, it's exciting to think about. Wow. Well, Eddie, this is, uh, it is really extraordinary work. And I mean, you can sort of go off in the science fiction and the, and the science of it. And, and, and something I really am impressed about you is, is, is the humanity of it comes through and that these are real people with real problems that you're solving. And so it's, uh, I think we're lucky to have you and, and thank you for doing this work. I think if I was a medical student, I heard this, I would want to do neurosurgery and <laughs> it's so exciting. So you should remember that medicine's pretty cool too, if you are listening. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate it. We'll be back next week with a COVID uh, session and thanks very much.